Hello. Yeah. May I ask everybody to take his or her seat, please, so we can start. the second part of our conference. Um, I'd like to welcome Yong Wu Li, the founding director of the Guangzhou Biennale. You must all know the Guangzhou Biennale in South Korea, and currently also the um, president of the Guangzhou Biennale Foundation, of course. Uh, and most importantly, relating to this conference, the interim president of the International Biennale Association. Um, Yong-Wu will introduce Bartomé Marie later. Uh, did you have a good lunch? Yes. So, uh, yes means no, or? <laughs> okay. Uh, Dear uh, colleagues and friends, uh, first of all, on behalf of the International BNN Association and its members, I would like to welcome you all to the first General Assembly of IBA, and uh, thank you for attending today's conference. And uh, it is with great pleasure to have you join this uh, momentous occasion. Uh, as you uh, witnessed the morning session, uh, the IBA board members and the organizers of the conference, this conference decided to be self-critical on the history of the Biennales, and they are phenomenal because biennial makers generally create and contextualize something loud or uncomfortable voices to current sociopolitical environments and uh, existing aesthetic canons, which are unavoidable uh, elements of the BNLs today. Do you believe biennials are too loud, come out rough and, rough and naive? Whatever they are to be defined, we need one of its kind in order, not just to keep the art world alive, but also to, to keep the sustainability of necessary uh, vehicle of active interactions between cultural consumers and, and producers. Unlike the other art institutions, Bionis constantly receive questions as to what we do and why we exist. Why Bionis? Why are there so many Bionis and what they do? Is it necessary to keep apart the task of Bionis in connection with authority? Do biennials merely serve as a marketing tool for the host city? Do they grow together? Are the host cities and the biennials mutually beneficial? Are biennials a product of global capitalism? Do they respond to social urgency and political issues as well? How will biennials overcome a climate of biennial or biennial fatigue today? As I respect more heated debates in the afternoon session, what needs to be noted is that we don't raise the same, same questions to museums and other relevant art institutions. I'm truly happy that uh, the IBA General Assembly is uh, celebrated in concurrence with the, the eighth edition of the Berlin Biennale of Contemporary Art. I, I wish to thank my colleague, Gabriel Lehon, the director of the KW Institute for Contemporary Art and, and her team for co-organizing with the, uh, the Kulturstiftung des Bundes for their general support in organizing today's uh, conference and general meeting. I would like to also thank our keynote speakers for today's conference, uh, Maria Hlovayeva, who spoke this morning, and also Bartomeu Mari, who just arrived from Barcelona, he is the uh, president of the CIMAM, and he's the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art Barcelona. And also seven panel members and the moderators, uh, uh, Koyo Kuo and Bigel Red this afternoon, who are generating thought-provoking discussions. Special thanks to also go to IBA STEM members. Lastly, I would like to thank the diverse constituents who have all contributed 
to the experimental and innovative chapter in the history of Binance and the contemporary art world. Especially thanks to go to LK Austin Moore and Marike Vanal. Three of us are uh, the real, uh, uh, the motivate, motivation, try to find uh, kind of clues on how we are going to form the, and formulate the Binance Association in this present moment. For the continuous present uh, collaboration and network created through this association, the IVA board and its members and myself hope for the further develop, development of the BNR in the future. I would like to introduce uh, uh, our distinguished guest and next uh, keynote speaker, Mr. Bartolomari, who is the president of CIMA, as I introduced. Bartomeo is a writer and curator. He was the curator of the Taipei Biennale in 2002 and the commissioner for Spanish Pavilion in Venice Biennale 2005 with Anthony Montadas. He also curated numerous exhibitions uh, such as uh, Raul Hausmann, uh, Lawrence Wiener, Rita McBride, Aurelia Valdocera, Francis Picabia, Pierre Bismus, Marcel Bortez, Michel Francois, and John Jonas, Peter Friedel, Francis Ellis. Would you like to welcome Bartomeu Murray? Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great uh, pleasure and an honor, to, an honor to be here and try to contribute to the debates that you are putting forward in your um, organization. Um, the first note that I have handwritten on my paper is bad English. It means that I wrote as I speak, and I speak quite bad English, if we compare to the excellent uh, um, quality of the, of the use of that language by many of you and especially my colleagues here. So excuse me, if you did, do not understand something, it's not about you, it's my fault. <laughs> so gratitude, I want to express the gratitude to the organizers uh, for the invitation, especially to Gabby Horn, who wrote uh, to me uh, such a nice invitation, I couldn't say no. Um, I know that you have also changed your sessions uh, for my late arrival, so double gratitude for your patience. After accepting the invitation, um, I started to be concerned and get, got a bit, a bit nervous, um, thinking about what would, I, what, what would I be saying here, since I'm not a theoretician or a critic. I also believe that I am not a curator anymore. Um, I have become, since 2008, a museum director, and even if that is something uh, still difficult to describe uh, for me, um, because I don't know what a museum director is, I must say that I have an idea about how do mu museum directors talk, walk, eat, and behave. So that's the, um, I thought what, what can we bring or um, which thoughts can be brought into this debate from the perspective of museums? Um, I also didn't have much time to rehearse my paper, so I think I'm a bit shorter than 45 minutes, but in order not to lose my track, I should um, control it. So, um, the title of this intervention, Why Associate, uh, seems to implicate that associating has benefits for those uh, who associate that they would not have before associating. What is the benefit of an association? How can a, muse how can a museum director contribute to the, to the reflection on the present and futures of such numerous and dynamic institutions as our uh, art biennials uh, today? The system of art has deeply changed in the past 20 years and is still in the middle of this process. Um, which we still don't know whether we have to call it an evolution or a revolution. Maybe the art system has been in deep change since it began, um, probably um, 
a bit more than a century ago. This is a good question for the panel on hi historizing, is when does it all begin? Um, we know that all art has been contemporary once, uh, but I believe that we could say that contemporary art begins with the 20th century. We could discuss this later. Um, yet the art system uh, has never been so big and so institutionalized as today. There are more and more museums, more and more galleries, more and more collectors, more and more advisors, more and more patrons, more and more Kunsthalles and art centers and artists in residence programs and postgraduate schools and audiences and auction houses and biennials. Um, my friend um, Jan Debaut, who uh, ran for many years the uh, Stedelijk van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven, used to tell an anecdote that explains a little bit these uh, changes. Um, and he said, mm, this probably he said about 10 years ago, so um, he said 10 years ago we would um, organize uh, we would uh, be uh, going to the exhibition of a major, well-known artist in a major exhibition uh, center, museum, uh, Kunsthalle, in Central Europe, and we would be 25 people in that opening. Um, a month later, we would go to another um, opening of an exhibition of a very prominent artist in another prominent museum in a uh, uh, city nearby, and we would be also 25 people, 15 of which were at the first uh, opening. Now we do an exhibition of a young artist who hasn't finished school. We have 500 people at the opening and we still think it wasn't a successful opening. So there are more and more of many things, but there are less and less art critics, less and less space in the mass media dedicated to art, and we'll try to precise it later. I think there are less magazines there is less funding for art, that is more private and less public. We need to analyze what does this mean and how to play with it. Um, speaking from the field of museums, uh, public museums or uh, museums dedicated to the public good have been placed traditionally in a rather high position in the uh, chain as providers of scientific authority, providers of value, and why not acknowledge it as sources of authority? Um, yet my friend Karl Schampers, who used to be the chief curator at the uh, um, Boymans Museum in Rotterdam and then directed the Franz Hals Museum in Harlem, um, was asking once, who does write art history? I was tended, and most of us would be tended to say, art critics, the academia, curators, museums do, do write art history. And he was saying, no, art history is written by collectors. Something to think about. Um, museums of modern and of contemporary art are um, where the institutions where one could read not only what was considered the most advanced production of art, but also the finest, the best. Museums, as many of my artists' friends in the 1980s thought, were also the ideal place, the best context where to present their work. Museums were considered to be neutral spaces, not affected by the rigors and caprices of the market. Today, one can see that um, what we considered public space, the museum space, has shrunk dramatically. Now, we know that museums aren't neutral either, and that they are equally affected by the forces that shape any other aspect of our environment. Brian O'Doherty told us already that in the early 70s, that how mm, not neutral and ideologi ideologized was the white cube that provided a model for most of the museums that exist today. O'Doherty has also written a number of essays uh, that I recommend, although I couldn't uh, find to quote. I am a, I am a not non-quote uh, speaker uh, today. Um, he wrote a number of essays that uh, explain very well the sensation of an artist who grew in an art system without money that suddenly sees money float uh, just 
inundate completely the system. Um, due to the changes in funding, both in Europe and the US, as far as I know, financing public culture, the access of the citizens to art in good quality context has been drastically reduced. In Europe, substantial um, cuts in public funding have been um, applied in the peripheral countries known as peaks. And I have the honor of uh, belonging to a peak country, so I know what I'm talking about. Holland, for ideological reasons, and I think there is also here, there are friends and colleagues of us that can speak in uh, better knowledge of the terms, has also applied substantial um, cuts of public spending in the arts uh, for ideological reasons. In the US, more and more private support for, for museums is now being um, redirected to food and shelter uh, initiatives. And sponsoring from corporations is being offered against uh, returns that affect the independence of the curator. Um, the quantitative has taken the place of the qualitative. The critic's voice has nearly disappeared. Numbers are everything. Either money or visitors, the pure objectivity of arithmetics also rule the art system. Whatever is not measurable doesn't count. Why associate? The art system contains many actors. Um, the interaction of which um, make that system work. In a work produced between 1983 and 1991, artist Antoni Muntadas um, analyzed the art system as he perceived it through that decade. In this work, um, Sorry, in his words, from an interview with Canadian uh, researcher Ambe Nishu, Muntadas declares, in the 1980s, the system of art changed. Um, in the art world, th first of all, there is uh, the work of the artist and all what surrounds the production of that work. And secondly, um, the system constructed around the mediation of the work, its presentation, its selling, its collecting, and so forth. Um, and that will affect the, and that will determine the visibility of the project. The 1980s represent a moment in which some of the intermediaries, of these intermediaries, accumulated excessive power and got an exaggerated visibility. That's what I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand how did we got to this situation. This is my translation from Catalan words, and these are some images of the presentation of this work. Um, uh, which the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona could acquire in 2009 after the artist, after that the artist gave all the documentation material uh, to the collection. And the museum, the, 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 between the frames, that is the title of the, um, of the work, and this is the version called the Forum, is a series of interviews to a number of uh, players um, um, brought together by um, categories or by uh, profession. Um, so the work is divided into eight chapters devoted each to uh, one group of actors of the system. And there are, in 1980, in, in 1981, when the piece was finished, these chapters were, what are you? Um, okay. Um, art dealers, collectors, galleries, museums, docents, which at the time that meant the, the museum guides, the educators, critics, media, mass media, and an epilogue where we can hear the voice of the artists. Um, the, the works, uh, the, each chapter contains a series of uh, statements from very well known, uh, and also some of them also uh, disappeared members of our art community. I don't, uh, I could, I would not um, describe further the work in detail, but just to say that um, um, in this map, we could be surprised, for instance, that art dealers and galleries are separated entities. That's, that's about the 80s. Um, today, it would be difficult to differentiate them as most galleries work as first, and second, and third, and fourth, and fifth market. Um, museum guides, or educators, and Muntadas calls it the docents at the time, are at least as relevant as curators, who are 
inside the category of museums, there were no independent curators, or not known as they are now. In the 80s, auction houses did not deal with contemporary art. Art fairs were not relevant for contemporary art. There were no marketing departments at art institutions. And there were just a few biennials of art. These are new players that have become essential in determining the value of artworks and the way culture works and art functions within this culture and provide media exposure visibility to both the specialized and non-specialized audience. All of you know more and much better uh, than myself about biennials and um, probably um, I tried not to be generalist and say what we already know um, all but I was um, my contact with these um, new formats because when I started working in back in um, the late 80s um, Biennials were not really the part of the landscape that, that they are now. In 1996, I was close witness to the very first edition of Manifesta in Rotterdam. Um, and in 2002, I was also close yet less um, more detached uh, within the organization of Manifesta 4 in San Sebastian. I was um, uh, involved in, I curated the Taipei Biennial in uh, in Taiwan in 2002 and in 2005 I had the experience of Venice. There are no, there are no two biennials who look alike. They are completely separated uh, and different uh, worlds. Um, and from again from the perspective of, uh, of the, um, uh, the director of a young museum in the uh, peak area of uh, Europe, um, the question at this moment uh, is not the, about the typologies of the art institutions and activities, but about the relationship between public interest and private resources. This is where I think the um, and public resources means also, excuse me, private resources means private interests. And I'm not saying that private, private interests are uh, evil, but the, uh, the question that really remains uh, prioritary is how do we define uh, public interest, uh, or what the Americans call public trust, and um, how do we uh, conciliate it with numerous private interests and uh, that come into play um, and as I said, not only in the old continent. In the, in the world of museums, especially in our area, we are living in a, in a moment of what we could call a reset. You know, it's that button you press on the computer so that it all starts, uh, it all um, starts again. And um, this reset involves not only the economic, uh, but it involves mainly the way we relate to audiences, to public, to citizenship. Um, most of uh, a lot of museums and the one that I have the honor of uh, of uh, being in front of form part of the um, uh, industry of cultural tourism and as such we are within dynamics that probably many uh, biennials also share um, the reset we live in concerns the uh, pull out, the way the public um, um, institutions are pulling out of the management of culture, um, has to do with the need to generate and maintain larger audiences and identify also your um, institution and the activity of your institution with citizenship, not only with tourist ship. Um, it implies that <clears throat> we still keep the educative role of our institutions as the first priority or one of the first priorities in, the, um, in, in our mission. And probably it also means that we are more and more, um, we are entering more and more a new field which has to do with different ways of dealing with entertainment. Um, that is probably another uh, another um, conversation or another lecture, but I think is part of the uh, reset we're dealing with. 
I do believe that biennials are opposite of museums because of the performative aspect, their temporality, the spirit of risk, discovery, site specificity, production of new works are characteristics that we expect from biennials. A, bi a biennial is like a festival. As the main character of Blade Runner says, the light that shines stronger shines shorter. Biennials are sprints. Museums are endless marathons. Bi biennials are kinetic. Museums are static. Biennials produce, museums collect, etc. Yet, I also know that museums can tend to behave sometimes as biennials, and biennials imitate museums as writers of history. Both museums and biennials assume excellence as a main criteria. Both use educational services. Both types of institutions entertain their publics, are equally concerned by economy, play a similar role in the sector of cultural tourism, etc. Some biennials feel like art fairs. Some art fairs behave like biennials. More and more museums have galleries for financial support for the presentation of exhibitions. 14 rooms at the last art fair uh, of Basel featured an extensive list of patrons, famous, prominent art patrons. And it looked like the opposite football team to that of the artists. You had the list of artists, then you had the list of the patrons. It's the first time I saw such um, use and presence of patronage, and that was in an art fair. Um, some collectors finance museum exhibitions with their properties, their collections is exhibited. Patronage and collecting go hand in hand, and sometimes we have to ask ourselves if patronage and sponsoring is not really programming museums. Art fairs tend to be museums, or biennials, or auction houses, and provide credits of academic value. Our time blurs the frontiers between the fields in which the actors are playing. Consequences of that is that in the middle of such confusion, a new code of ethics, a new deontology must be written. The rules of the play need to be clarified again as financing of public culture is no longer in the hands of public institutions. But what is public culture today? What is public anymore? Who is public? Culture also represents, in all cases, the interests of private resources and what we are asked, that we are asked to bring in the system by those who are responsible of the administration of the public good. In more and more contexts and countries, we live in a totally deregulated um, financial system. The investments in art is one of the most obscure fields of financial operation, as more and more economists and lawyers are beginning to say openly. Why associate then? Um, I would like to introduce the result of some associations with which um, we have been involved um, in recent years, the first, the first of which is the Consortium L'Internationale, of uh, I believe most of you have heard of, and um, um, that was it's a consortium um, or a confederation originally f funded by, founded by Moderna Galleria in Ljubljana in Slovenia, Stedelijk van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven, Muka um, in Antwerp in Belgium, the Julius Koehler Society in Bratislava and Magba. In the first phase that took place between 19, uh, 2010 and 2012, there were a number of activities, especially exhibitions, that put, in, uh, put, put forward an idea that was central to the, to the founding intentions. A second phase started in 2013, and as before, it benefits from um, grants, an important grant from the um, European Union for uh, stimulating the, the production of uh, <clears throat> cultural uh, collaboration between countries member of the, um, members of the um, Union. Um, we associated because we compete um, or better said, we associated because we need to compete. The museum world has become polarized into two areas. In one, we have a few very big museums that dictate the canon and elaborate the dominant narrative. In the other group, we have the rest. 
small and medium-sized museums are less prepared to survive the big changes of our times. They cannot compete with the collections and blockbuster exhibitions of the big museums. Some museums function as brands, and artists that attract large crowds of visitors are also brands. If you are not a brand, or if you don't have brands inside, inside your galleries, your museum is not going to be able to attract um, um, large amounts of audience and sponsorship will not come to you. The vicious circle is served and the question is how do we transform the vicious circle into a circle of virtue. We began by associating. Scholarship, scientific research is worth nothing in this moment. If you don't have brands in your collection, you need to obtain them as temporary loans for your exhibition programs. Yet, if you do not have brands to exchange with those who have other brands, museums will not lend you their brands, and you start from zero again. L'Internationale was created. I mean, I think about the. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm curious to to see what what kind of um, um, new uh, scholarship was brought to uh, the knowledge of the community by the last Dali exhibition, um, which followed another Dali exhibition like three years ago at Tate Modern and another Dali exhibition at Pompidou Center probably five years ago. I mean, at this rate, every five years there will be a Dali uh, exhibition because it brings three million people to your museum and that's a lot of money. L'Internationale was created because we thought this is not true. The members believe, among other things, that there should be another way of doing things, not only the way big museums operate. If we consider the collections of these museums, these museums members of the International Consortium, uh, if we consider those, those collections as a unified entity, yet kept in dispersed storages across Europe, um, we obtain not only a big collection, but especially a very rich, very varied, yet very complementary and coherent collection. Um, these are images of the, of the exhibition that was shown in 2000, I think it was 11, of the um, uh, 2000 plus East uh, collection of the Moderna Galleria in Ljubljana. And then parallel to this, there were um, uh, works, we mixed the collections and we, um, there were works from the collections of every museum to be seen in every different museum but presented as the collection of L'Internationale. This is uh, um, just a, a, little, a little example of the result. I still believe that museums are, are a collection first. Probably we could discuss that because museums are much more, but that is the distinctive element to the, um, between the museums and other institutions. Um, and I would like to insist that the um, uh, need to associate with L'Internationale was not only about the ownership or sharing about, of artworks. It was, not, uh, it was about an alternative way of narrating history, the, narrating the history of contemporary art. We believe in the notion of situated knowledge that says that knowledge is not only linked in time, but especially to place the narratives that are produced in Barcelona is different from the narratives that are produced in Bratislava. Yet similarities and echoes and reverberations begin to intersect with each other when uh, you put this approach into play. For instance, um, uh, when we started looking at the collections as a unity, we started seeing how important, the, 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 how central the notion of experimental poetry uh, or visual poetry was in the, it was common to all the collections from the 60s to the 80s. Um, it appeared something very uh, interesting and I'm looking forward also the new exhibition that Tate Modern will do about, um, in our cases it appeared something that we call the European pop um, which in many cases is confused with conceptual art, but that it tells a lot about a, crit uh, a critique of consumerism and um, 
that uh, you know from the Richard Hamilton to the nouveau realist in France to uh, many other artists again in the east and in the, Spain and Portugal and also in South America um, begin to appear um, it appears how much the architecture and uh, play with the urban space is important in, in, in all these collections how the performative and the, and the participatory practices have um, also a common uh, presence, how sexual political emancipation against paternalism, militarization and censorship is um, present. The dominant, the dominant discourses that narrate the history of the art of our times in, uh, are, is elaborated in Central Europe, and especially in the US, where also the vocabulary with which we narrate and the, chronology frame, the chronological frameworks are established and elaborated. Suddenly, our peripheral modernities cannot be narrated because the vocabulary does not correspond with the reality we have with us. And our calendars do not coincide with the dominant timeline. Um, very quickly, um, I wanted to read some um, um, statements from <clears throat> Oscar Hansen, the reason I could not come yesterday. We opened this exhibition yesterday, and Oscar Hansen is a, is a Polish architect who um, was a member of Team 10, and Team 10 is the first uh, 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 well-articulated critic to the orthodoxy of modern architecture. Uh, the first meeting, I think, is in 1954 in Otterloh, and uh, architects like Bakema or Aldo Van Eyck, uh, among many others, uh, are a part of, of this group. Oscar Hansen took, took part in this, in this group, and he presented his theory, theory of the open form. And open form is um, something that he developed in architecture, but he ended up applying to the teaching of art, because the Polish government uh, did not allow him to build for a long period of time, and he took refuge in the Academy of Fine Arts. He ended up um, teaching, forming many different generations of, well, several generations of Polish artists, among which Pavel Altamir, Artur Smizewski, um, and so forth. Um, open form is about association, is about collaboration. And I thought these words, since I had them fresh in my mind near me, could be interesting to uh, be brought also to the um, to, the, to this uh, event. Hansen says, we believe in the possibility of non-conflicting cooperation with other artists, in the possibility of a group work. The artist should be free and disinterested, and the new should emerge on the verge of the me-others during cooperation. Everybody has an innate need to overcome their own isolation uh, and unite with other people. Open form intended not only democratic architectural space, but also to influence the way people communicate and coexist, negotiate the living space. In, the nut in a nutshell, the aim was to understand each other better and to retain individuality within a crowd, to attain equilibrium between individual expression and the need to form community. Participation demands being open to unpredictable situations and to the individual expression of others, the ability to improvise, the, need, the, red, the readiness to undertake dialogue. Manifesting one's personality takes place together with others, but not at others' expense. Um, these lines were, and many others, were written within the context of a communist society by an architect who uh, pretended uh, than expected um, to influence the way the environment uh, of his uh, country would be uh, built. After the Second World War, Europe can be reconstructed, and it's the moment in the 50s where uh, the last large utopias from the art world come into being, and I recall here um, uh, Constant New Babylon, for instance, is a very good example. The projects of uh, Jonah, Fri uh, Jonah Friedman um, and uh, Open Form of Oscar Hansen are part of this. Um, I will end with some images very quickly that um, speak 
about another form of uh, association that is more pragmatical, is more, um, um, let's say, very uh, even basic, because it concerns the union of two collections. One, uh, since we're, we were speaking about the public and the private, um, it's a good example uh, to be discussed, uh, an example by which I have been uh, quite criticized by some uh, of my colleagues, but that um, I br very briefly, this is still Oscar Hansen, I didn't know that I had so many images. Um, and I spoke before about the fact that a museum is a collection, um, is many more things than a collection, but begins with that. And uh, in my um, in in my experience, I have to the, the 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 first museum that I have. I worked before uh, in a museum of modern contemporary art in the 90s with a beautiful collection, but I was not involved in either the managing or the development of, of that of, of that collection. Um, Magba is a young museum. It's, it opened its doors in 1995, and it started collecting uh, years later. The collection of, of the museum is, is um, developed, or what we call the collections of the museum are the collections that were acquired by the City Council of Barcelona and the Catalan government, who in parallel were collecting independently without talking to each other. Um, since the, these institutions were reinstalled after Franco, uh, uh, time. And in the early 90s, after the Olympics of 1992 in Barcelona, uh, City Council of Barcelona, Catalan government, and a private foundation created the Magba Consortium. The um, City Council and, and government deposited their collections in the museum, and the Magba Foundation, which is a private institution composed of individuals and companies uh, that provide uh, the funds to develop the collection, uh, begun a uh, thorough and uh, serious um, international collection of contemporary art, as opposed to mainly the local, uh, the, the survey of the local scene by city council and Catalan government. I have five minutes still, um, and I'm finishing. Um, after m many years, we um, identified that La Caixa Foundation which has also been collecting since the 80s, um, was developing exactly the same, uh, the same activity, but completely separated from the museum. And we proposed to unite the collections, by which um, we um, uh, acquired access to um, artworks uh, that it, could be, it, it would be impossible to collect today, mainly uh, late minimalism, Arte Povera. Uh, you have seen um, a great installation of Bruce Nauman, uh, Ronnie Horn, um, et cetera, et cetera, a large amount of works that today would be impossible to um, uh, acquire. The price in the market of these works is uh, far, puts, it, puts, puts them far out of our reach. Um, in all cases, these associations um, give us possibilities. They do not give the museum any obligation. This is the, the, the good thing, but that put together with, uh, this is a fantastic work by Irving Falstrom, also in, uh, in the hands of the Magba collection, is it suddenly possible to speak about the second half of the 20th century in a much more um, organized and thorough way um, so that again was um, is an, is uh, probably um, this uh, association uh, is what we will do with it. In itself, is nothing, but um, in order to be able to tell stories, narrate from your point of view, and not have to repeat. Um, the vocabulary, the timelines, and the um, uh, grammars uh, of um, the dominant um, centers, you also need to have access to this material. Um, I think I left out a number of uh, thoughts that I'm not going to try to rewind to go back to it, but uh, in many cases, I think 
um, and what I like about this this, uh, um, this situation is that we can we can discuss um, how much biennials uh, look like museums if we consider its potential for transforming archives into collection, if we consider the um, the potential of education uh, or the way they are they can be the seat to future developments of uh, more uh, static or more continuated um, activity. Uh, biennials, uh, traditional biennials like Sao Paulo or Venice are within contexts very densely populated with museums, but there are many, many, many uh, other biennials, especially in, in, in new areas of the world that did not have um, a museum uh, tradition that begin their contacts or uh, uh, explore their, their contacts with, with contemporary art through the format of a festival or a biennial. I think, I think for instance, the tradition, the tradition of the Pan-African festivals is something that belongs to our history of exhibitions and deserves to be also uh, narrated, studied, and uh, debated. Conclusions. Um, biennials, I see biennials as completely uh, complementary and nearly equal to museums. They become often institutional partners of museums, sharing even the contradictions we live in. In some contexts, as I said, biennials play the role of museums and archives become collections. Biennials also form audiences, they educate. And um, I think education is important because there is um, uh, something that we could call the new visual literacy that asks us to interrogate who is constru constructing the new the, the visual grammars of this literacy. That means also that there are new forms of visual illiteracy. And here, um, as we are immersed into processes that have to do with the decolonization of the museum, taking the museum outside, outside of the apparatus of oppression and dominance, I think probably as well biennials have to address its own decolonization. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, actually, we wanted to also have the opportunity to have some questions <laughs> to you, Bartome. <laughs> So anybody? I thought I was done. <laughs> I don't see anything, that, the, the, so you, you should. Uh, Bartomeu, thank you very much. Um, I'm in front of you. Okay. <laughs> there. I, I'm blinded no. by the spots. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you in one phrase, um, you said that thank to a biennial the, of, on the transformation from archive to collection. I find it quite worrying to take the symbolic value and to put it in the collection and then the story of the market, I find quite difficult. And uh, if you can a bit elaborate about the new trend of museums uh, hmm. buying archives from artists okay. or buying archive in general to the collection and not put them in the, col in the archive. OK. It's a good question. Um, I, in this case, I was thinking more of, um, of the fact that biennials and art events, museums and uh, art centers and so on, generate, if, you do, if they document well their activity, they, they generate an archive about their, 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 own, their own activity that uh, very often acquires a great relevance. And of course, I do believe in the separation of what we call archive to what we call the collection, but with uh, the archival uh, activity, you soon begin to prepare what will be to maintain, to 
um, show, to, inter to interpret, to communicate, um, uh, whatever you can call a collection. Um, so that is uh, uh, museums, um, I think many museums have had archives and collections since many, many years, but the archives were inside the libraries. Uh, I think the, the um, yet in what you said is very important. I am against the fact that archives become a marketable uh, product or a marketable item. Um, but I cannot do anything if the uh, Getty Foundation, for instance, throws a bunch of money on the table to acquire the entire archive of uh, an artist, as they have done and they continue doing uh, very often. This means that, um, this means that uh, the research, the history that can be written about that will be in, in, in the hands of um, institutions. Um, and if they are put at the disposal of researchers publicly, freely, uh, is fine. But we know how limited this access can be in some cases. Um, that, is, that is a very complicated uh, thing. Um, in Spain, we had a very, very strange situation several years ago, which concerned the fact that the Catalan government and the Spanish government were fighting uh, with each other for the acquisition of the archive, the, negative, uh, the negatives of uh, Agustí Centelles, who is the Spanish Robert Capa. He's the photographer of the Spanish Civil War. And he was in exile for many years, and after Franco died, he returned. And um, the Catalan government was negotiating with the sons of this uh, man after his death the acquisition of this um, uh, archive of negatives when the Spanish government paid an enormous amount of money and brought it to Madrid. Um, now, if you want to research about the history of, of, um, of that, in, and mainly the, the photographs of Centelles concern the fronts in, the, um, in Aragon and the Catalan area, you have to go to Madrid. And if you follow the, the news uh, and the media about these relationships between the Catalan government and the Spanish government, you can imagine that this is not an easy thing to do right now. Um, yet, I am against um, as much as possible the transformation of archival material into commercial items. Um, if I have to be very pragmatic, I must say that the market nowadays um, eats it all. I mean, the, the, I, I don't know any area of um, artistic production and interest and value that is not already uh, invested by uh, markets. So uh, in our cases or in cases of museums, we have to believe in the honesty and the goodwill of uh, hairs and artists and um, and um, uh, descendants or or yeah the hairs of the of the of these estates when 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 the artist is no longer there. What we try to do as well, and we did it in several cases, is deal with that and arrange it when the artist is still alive. So we we are we are uh, we are we have done several um, contracts of um, of donations uh, mortis causa. As, as it is called in, in legal terms. But anyway, as I said, this is, these are exceptions probably to a rule that, that is extending pretty much.